to a large extent, we covered this yesterday with Paul, so it's just a recap to keep you safe. Feel free to take a photo of this or whatever. Um, I think I have it written out somewhere, I can email it to you. So rule number one in the world of mushroom hunting is, to quote Eddie McGee, know your stuff and never bluff, or if in doubt, leave it out. Um, because, another classic line, everything is edible, sometimes only once. <laughs> Mushrooms is a few, as Paul mentioned yesterday, come into that category. And the, if you get it wrong, it's going to go very badly wrong. So never, ever take a chance with mushrooms. The two books I very strongly recommend you purchase if you're going to get into foraging are Roger Phillips' book, simply called Mushrooms. I think it's Mushrooms of Britain and Northern Europe. And you can also go to rogersmushrooms.com where he put the whole thing online for free. But there's nothing beats having a field guide with you. So that is your kind of Bible for mushroom hunting. And then the other book I really recommend is The Collins Guide to Edible Mushrooms. And the nice thing about The Collins Guide is it covers all the main common edibles and all the hellish and toxic ones. So when you find your mushroom, you look it up in the book, in, Ro in uh, Roger Phillips, work out the size, time of year, the habitat, the trees you find it under, and make sure you're ticking all those boxes. And when that's all lined up, then get the Collins Guide out, look it up in the Collins Guide, and it will appear on the left-hand page. And on the right-hand page, there are all the potential look-alike species. So then you can go back to Roger Phillips and go through the four or five or six look-alike species, look them up in detail, and just double-check that you're on the right path. Um, so that book, those two books used in unison are um, pretty good. There's a lot of really rubbish fungi, fungi books out there. I've done um, courses in the past in the New Forest. I once was lucky enough to do a course with a guy called Derek Reed, who was the head of mycology at Kew Gardens for quite a long time. And we did um, one big extended foray. And I kid you not, in the car park, there's probably about 10 mushroom books went directly in the bin in the car park. They just didn't agree, and half of them were completely wrong. So, um, yeah, be choosy about what literature you use. So, the first rule with mushroom hunting is know thy enemy. Paul covered this in quite some depth, but just to recap on the Amanitas, they all have white gills, so if you don't pick any mushrooms with white gills, you have reduced your ability to kill yourself probably by about 90%, just off the bat. And there's not that many good edibles with white gills. I can only think of maybe two or three. So you're not knocking out too many edibles by employing that rule. So all of the Amanita family have white gills. The issues with the Amanitas, and Paul was saying you should only really, for eating purposes, choose young but mature mushrooms. So don't collect them in their button phase, in their little juvenile stage as they're growing up. Because if you look at that, a baby Amanita, just as the gills are starting to form and you can see evidence of the stipe appearing, that could easily be confused for a puffball because it's just a little white ball in the ground and you go, oh cool, puffball. Which is why you must always cut the puffballs in half or something you think is a puffball and inspect for um, the formation of gills. So a puffball has to be pure white throughout. So a few people have been nobbled by that with the picked baby amanitas and ended up um, losing their kidneys as a, as and, a result. And if you cut that in half at that stage, what would you think? It looks like an alien head. You can see that the alien's eyes looking uh, back yeah. at you. That's the gills forming oh, okay. inside. Is that a sliced Think of it at, at Tesco's button mushroom, you know, with a big fat stem. When you cut it in half, you can see the gills quite neatly on either side. Whereas a puffball is completely white throughout, it's just a white ball. And then the evolution of the Amanita, you can see here it's the, the stipe, the stem that erupts, and that's how the main fungi grows. So this white protective skin that um, was its uh, embryonic sac when it was little ruptures as the stem pushes up. And in many of the Amanitas, you've got remnants of that sac left on the cap, the white spots from the fly agaric or the panther cap or the Amanita excelsior. They, quite a few of them have that scaling. That is not a bulletproof ident point because if you've had heavy rain, they can actually wash off. So you could end up picking something um, that you think is edible, but it's, it was an Amanita at one point, or still is, but it's just lost its scaling. And also, the 
protective covering on the bottom of the gills also ruptures and drops down the stem and that forms a skirt or a veil is another term for it sometimes and generally with thaminators you'll get striations on there where you can actually see where the, the spores have dropped out and left a, a, an imprint on the skirt itself it's one of the key ident features for example of, of the grisettes or the um, parasol mushrooms are the only fungi with a movable skirt you can actually let it run up and down the stem um, a bit like a rubber band on a stick it can just jump along whereas all the other families it's welded in place and you'll tear it if you pull on it so with the mature fruiting body of an amanita remember what paul was saying about unearthing them with a fork mm -hmm. they all have this volval sac so if you encounter a fungi with a volval sac, it's probably going to be bad news for you and just disregard it immediately. <coughs> so that's your amanitas. There are a couple of edibles. There's a couple of really good edible amanitas, especially in France and um, uh, Northwest Europe. Like the Prince, the Augustus agaricus, um, is a fantastic mushroom. We um, had one of those a couple of weeks ago. Mm. I haven't seen it for 12 years, I've actually looked at I've heard a few yeah. people say they found yeah. princes this year, yeah. Um, but by and large, as a novice fungi collector, learn the Amanita features and just leave them out. That's more of an advanced skill, really. So then, coming on to the four big hitters that you can eat pretty much with impunity if you obey some super simple rules. Firstly, if it's ball-shaped, you're straight into puffball territory. So you cut it in half, it's completely white throughout. It's not going yellow or cobwebby, it's not turning to spores yet, the meat is good and solid. All of the puffballs are edible. There's a whole range of them from the little incy wincy lycoperdon perlatums that we found the other day. You've got some with little spikes on them, lycoperdon piriform. You get mosaic puffballs, which are about the size of a galley of melon with um, like roof tiles, or like a mosaic all over the surface. They're also eating, quite rare, right up to the is it Langermania gigantea. The giant puffballs which can be up to 80 cm's in diameter mm. but providing it's ball shaped and it's white throughout you're safe as houses and they're phenomenally good eating mushroom uh, roger phillips also has another book called wild food um, which is a wonderful book big photo guide the super nice thing about it is every photograph has got the location and the date under it so that um, you, you know you're in the range and his recipe for um, giant puffball is to do pretty much what we did with it last night, um, egg wash it, bread crumb it, and then fry it in a frying pan in bacon grease. So cook up your bacon first and then mm -hmm. pop all the straight in. Mm -hmm. Super good. Uh, I've also hollowed them out and um, put in things like field mushrooms and shallots that I've fried off in a pan, packed them, bread crumbed them, cheesed them, and then pop them in the oven for 20 minutes. So that's super good as well. Then we get onto the trumpet chip fungi. There is only one trumpet shaped mushroom which has got no gills, no sponge, and no spines. Anyone know what that could be? It's a brown trumpet mushroom. Did you? The horn of plenty. Yeah. The horn of plenty, exactly. So, trumpet shaped, no gills, no spines, um, and no sponge, and that takes you to horn of plenty. Generally, when you find one, you find a lot. You suddenly realise you've been walking over them. Because they're leaf mould coloured, they're almost mm. invisible. Mm. They're a very good stock mushroom. They pack a lot of flavour. They can be a bit fibrous and chewy, but to put it in as a base in a stew, it really gives it a real rich, deep mushroomy taste, which is lovely. And they dry very well, so they can keep in a jar indefinitely. We'll get on to, well, uh, chanterelles. You, you ran through in the winter chanterelles, but we'll, we'll kind of touch on them briefly before we go. And then fungi with sponge on the underside and providing when you split the stem or break off the cap if there is no flush of pink, red or orange, you are good to go. So there's Boletus erythropilus, the bitter bolete, and Boletus satanus, Satan's bolete or the devil's bolete. Those two will give you very bad gastric upset but won't kill you. So there is no deadly Bolete. The Bolete family, the spongy cut mushrooms, there's um, three core families. There's the Boletus, the Swilus, and the Lexinum. 
the Swilus and the Lexinum tend to have a slimy, gelatinous, slippery cap that never really dries out. The most common, the famous one is the Slippery Jack, which is a good edible. You find that a lot in the large woodlands. Um, and the big hitter that we're always chasing is the Sep or Porcini. Um, the old English name for it is the Penny Bun, because it looks like a perfect cake um, bun. In America, they call it the King Bowit. In Germany, they call it Steinpilsen, the stone mushroom. Porcini is, translates as little pig in Italian. So it's a, yeah, anywhere in the boreal belt, the Sep grows, and it's a phenomenal mushroom. Uh, in a London market, you'd be paying £20 a pound wet weight for perfect Seps. So it's, you can eat like a king if you know where you're looking. Um, it's one of the few wild mushrooms that you can eat raw as well. If you find a perfect um, juvenile, small, solid mushroom, you can finally slice that into a salad and it's uh, awesomely good. You can also pickle them. So if you blanch them, boil them hard in vinegar for just a couple of minutes, it just kills any microbes that are potentially in there, bacteria, and then you can pop them straight into some extra virgin olive oil and they'll just keep all winter and you can just hook out little button steps and slice them into salads, they're amazing. And they dry amazingly well. And then we get to the fungi that have got spines under the cap, which you collected oodles of them. The Hydnum rapandum, the hedgehog, wood hedgehog. You also have the terracotta hedgehog, which is slightly more rusty red than that. And then if you go further north into Scotland, up into the Caledonian pine forest, you'll find one that is velvety red, but still has spines. It's called the Sarcodon, and all three of those are excellent edibles. The rank is potentially be my top, <coughs> top three mushrooms, edibility-wise. I love this one from a culinary perspective because it's so solid. It doesn't go all sluggy and slimy or break up. You can just do so much with it. Simply fried in butter and toast, you know, it's an amazing breakfast or in pizzas, or you can make soup from it. Yeah, so it's a really versatile fungi. Just remember to brush the spines off, ideally done in the woods, because they're all laid in the spores, so you can leave all the spines, will keep glowing out spores when you're long gone. That's why we collect in baskets, so that the spores have a chance to, to drift as you're moving through the woods. We were finding hedgehogs now in places that we haven't encountered them before around our base camps, where we're altering our landscape by moving plants around. So, that's your kind of four that get to talk to the special forces guys, because it's, it's pretty idiot proof. If you stick to those really simple rules, you've probably got about 30 good mushrooms available to you to go at 100% safe. And then as you move and get, become a bit more advanced, I'd recommend the next fruiting bodies you tackle are the ones that grow in trees. Generally any fungi that's growing on a dead tree above one meter in height is going to be pretty safe to go at. There's very few tree fungi that will do you any harm at all. There's one that looks a little bit like the jelly ear. Did you find any jelly ear yesterday? Yeah, there's some down there. Yeah, yeah there's there. some in the elder yeah. on the way out. But it's black and it tends to grow in hazel, which again will cause gastric upset. But the majority of the other tree-based fungi are just too woody to digest and you just wouldn't have a go at them. However, at the base of some trees, you have the cauliflower fungus, exclusively at the base of Scott's pine, it looks like a cauliflower or a human brain. There's nothing else that looks like it apart from the hen of the woods, which, have you shown them that? No, I don't think oh, You might as well grab it. Yeah. Where is it? It's on the table and stuff. Ross found a, a lookalike called the hen of the woods, which is very similar, and um, they're both awesomely good eating mushrooms. Looks a bit like when you break it up like um, walnuts. It, it and actually has quite a nutty texture. It's really deep, rich, mushroomy, almost truffly taste to it. It's excellent. The chicken of the woods. Has anyone seen that before? Yeah. Quite common on tannic rich trees. It loves. Yeah. That's Ross's big hen. <laughs> it's got dish shaped sort of um, brackets coming out, each individual one. That's about a quarter of the size of the original thing. Wow. About that big. And that's edible, yeah? yeah? Yeah, really good. Oh, is that on the side of the tree? So? That was growing at the base. Oh, um, my friend found it, but it was growing at the base of a oak yeah. tree. They so are, they're exclusive to oak. Occasionally ash, I think, but I've never seen it on ash, yeah. but oak predominantly. Yeah, and the cauliflower is exclusive to Scots pine. So, chicken of the woods looks like builder's styrofoam. The sulfur polypore is the other name for it. It's sulfur yellow. 
and it doesn't look like anything else in the world. You just see this thing and you're like, what the hell is that? It's a big, massive sulfurous orange um, bracket fungus. Some of them will, you know, I've seen them the size of this sheet of paper, like they're enormous. They love tannic rich trees, so look on oaks, um, cherries, you find them a lot on. They will also grow in yew. My rule is I won't harvest a chicken of the woods from a yew tree because the needles are so toxic. And it's quite a convoluted fungi, so it's quite easy for the needles to fall in and become absorbed into the flesh as it grows around them. And also on sweet chestnut down in the south of the country. The bee stick fungus, super easy um, to ID, sometimes called an ox tongue. When you cut it, it's so deeply rich in tannic acid it bleeds red juice, it looks like blood. It takes a bit of processing because it's so tannin, tannin rich, it's quite bitter. So if you soak it in salty water overnight or in milk, it'll leach out a lot of the tannins. Then just finely slice it and um, cook it like steak, just fry it up in a pan, a little bit of salt and pepper and it's great. The chicken of the woods actually, when you break that up, it resembles chicken flesh, like a barbecued chicken. Um, you can actually soak it in chicken stock and I guarantee you that if you feed it to someone, they won't tell the difference. It's amazing. Wow. The oyster fungi look like oysters, a grey dish shape fungi about the size of an oyster and they stack up in tiers and tiles. Uh, there's two types, there's the true oyster, the Osteatus platorius, and there's a, a beige oyster called the Osteatus cornucopia. Both excellent edibles, the cornucopia can give some people flatulence, so you get a little bit gassy afterwards, um, beyond that they're both the same. They tend to grow a lot on beach stumps. You find them in the city parks a lot. Fitz Park is full of them. From the far right. Yeah, where the big trees have been taken out because they're a hazard and literally they're, they're just covered. And they're really good. There is one lookalike which could harm you with that. It's called Angel's Wings, but it is white gills and it's a white mushroom. So if you obey the top rules of avoid anything with white gills, you're safe as houses. But a few folks have made that mistake. And the jelly ear we talked about it used to be called the Jew's ear, but allegedly that's too politically incorrect. It's called the Jew's ear because it grows exclusively on the elder tree, which is the tree that allegedly Judas Iscariot hung himself off in shame after the betrayal of Christ. Why it has become jelly ear, I don't know. I think withdrawing every Gideon's Bible to cover up that story might be quite a costly affair. So I'm quite happy to call it a Jew's ear. The botanical name is Orcularia, Orcularia Orcula, as in oral, Judea. So, good mouthful, fancy one. Once you nail down your tree fungi, the next simple ones to get to are moving into the world of guild fungi, but if in doubt, leave them out. Be super cautious. Never think, well, it kind of looks like that. Let's just risk it um, because it could be a terminal mistake. So. The five common ones to go for first are the shag shaggy ink caps. They grow in lawns. They like trimmed grass. You see them in people's gardens a lot. I frequently am bailing over people's gardens, garden walls, swooping and running off again. They are a long conical shaped um, cup, cap to the, the mushroom, and the bottom of them auto digests and turns to ink. There is a common ink cap which doesn't have any curls or scales in the cap which is also edible, but reacts very violently to alcohol if it's in your system. Um, Coprinus alimentarius, the um, alcoholics are given a compound called coprin, which is chemically the same, which basically makes you vomit and feel terrible if you ingest it. So if you have had alcohol in your system for 48 hours beforehand, you're in for a rough ride. So shaggy only. Same with the parasols, the parasol fungi. Um, this rule doesn't apply for France and further south because there's a few toxic ones, but in the UK the parasols are big dinner plate sized mushrooms from a saucer to a dinner plate. They're really obvious, nutty brown top, the shaggy's got shaggy scaly curls and they're common, it's just got a flat surface, white stem, which looks like snake skin, little black flecks on it, and the skirt will run up and down like a rubber band on the stem. So it's a, quite an easy one to learn to ID. The common um, parasol is Macrolepiota ricodes. 
and when you snap the stem it flushes pink. Some people have idiosyncratic reactions to that. Some people can eat it with impunity, but some people's body chemistry just re reacts to it and you vomit. It's not a like a horrific, you feel no nauseous for, for ages, your body just goes, oh, don't like this yak, and gone, and then you feel fine again. Uh, but the shaggy one, uh, nobody reacts to, and that is plain white when you crack it open, crack open the stem. Saffron milk cap is a weird looking mushroom. It's a big tube chip trumpet mushroom, usually about this size. It usually has a sinister kind of greeny um, color to the center of it, and apart from that, it's saffron orange in color. It's a member of the milk cap family, so when you cut it or break it, it exudes latex, literally like, like orange milk runs out of it. You can run a fingernail on the gills and it just starts weeping, so it's super easy to ID. It has one lookalike, which is also orange, but it's also edible as well. Um, I quite like just using it as a saffron substitute and then um, put it in with my rice and you get vivid orange rice. It's quite cool. So for a mushroom rice dish, steam cook your rice and then fry it off in a frying pan with some saffrons. It's awesome. Really funky. The chanterelles you guys picked loads of yesterday. Did you find any false chanterelles? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, no, sorry, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. winter, 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 you find the winters. So yeah. the winter chanterelles are yellow legs. The only risk with those guys, you saw the lookalike, the jelly babies. Yeah, so only pick mature yellow legs with a nice big stem on them, and that keeps you out of jelly baby territory because the jelly babies never get bigger than a jelly baby. Um, and the chanterelle can be confused with the false chanterelle. You kind of need to have hands on with both. However, um, the gills of the false chanterelle look like the gills of a Tesco's mushroom. They're all neat and straight. They're not forking, they're not branching. They're all stacked up together and they all start at the exact same point on the stem. Whereas you've been up close and personal with the chanterelles, I describe the gills as looking like veins on a bodybuilder. You know, they're rubbery and ropey and they fork and meander all over the place. And they all start at different points in the stem. Also, the true chanterelle has a faint smell of the apricots, whereas the false doesn't. The true chanterelle also has a lovely egg yolk yellow colour, whereas the false has more of a, a lurid yellow colour to it. Reminds me of a, like a Toulouse-Lautrec painting. It's got that French gaslight look to it. It doesn't look that super edible. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a quick overview of the best of. Is that useful? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And the, side, the, the spongy layer one, that's yep. the way you can see the, the tubes. Yes, spore tubes. Side. Looks yeah. like a bath sponge. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the three families, the sticky caps, the swilus and the lexinum, and the dry caps, which are the both true beliefs. And the, the true set, the key item feature Paul may or may not have said is if you look at the first centimetre of stem under the cap, about a finger's depth, it look like someone's prick sticked on some mosquito net. It's the only Boletus that has that mosquito net mesh under the cap. So that gives you good confidence as well. However, if you're going to screw up with the Boletus, I mean, you probably end up picking a bay Boletus or a brown birch Boletus and thinking it's a Boletus edge of and both of those are awesome it's eaters anyway, so it doesn't matter. So they're, they're a pretty good safe one to go at. It's just that orangey, pinky stem of the Satan's Boletus and the bitter Boletus. The bitter belief, again, if you just nibble a bit of the cap, you're like, oh, wow, that's like mega peppery. Um, so you'll know about it instantly anyway. You won't eat enough of it to do you any harm.